thanks, thanks everyone to be here in the morning. Just I take the opportunity of people arriving to explain you who is these people who, has, who is watching us since, since two weeks. That's Maurice Levy is the founder of uh, this institute. And he founded this institute almost 60 years ago, a little bit more than that. At this period, it was nothing as it is today. People were camping around and had the, had the lecture in a small building around, and now the building is evolving among the time. So it's not the director of the school, and, and, and because he is not as um, proud of himself to, to, to be in the institute during all the time. Uh, so today, I just want to make a, a, a reminder of what we have said last time, in order to be sure Despite the fact that we will not insist on that, we will go to completely different things, but I mean, repeating is always a nice idea. Um, first of all, I just want to remind you that surface tension is a force which is parallel to the interface, and we spend kind of a lot of time to discuss why and the role of the density profile close to the interface. We discuss the fact that interfaces have, have a thickness, and this thickness is usually nanometric, but if we go close to a critical point, then it can be huge, it can be really thick, and there, have been, there has been system on critical demixing where the interfaces had really low surface tension and really high thicknesses. Um, we discussed the role of the surfactants, and we discussed the fact that surfactants go to the inter interface, but they are, only in the they are also in the bulk, which is also important. We discussed the fact that CMC is not the moment where the surface is filled with the surfactant. And we also discussed about, we discuss a lot about contact angle and the fact that, well, contact angle needs to know a surface energy of a solid, and the surface energy of a solid, usually we don't know it. We discuss also that there are some ways to have some idea about what is the surface energy of a, of a solid, and, well, the fact that when there is contact angle hysteresis, then we have to be cautious with the contact angle determination. Well, so today I make the tentative of menu. Um, I will make first a short introduction about surface stress. I wouldn't like to go too much into the detail about what is surface stress, but there is, there is kind of a very uh, huge and deep excitation about this concept these years. So I just want you to know that there is a debate and what is surface stress. And then I plan to discuss about the friction of fluids and the friction of solids. And, and Suzanne, who is smart but also pessimistic, she told me that I won't be able to do that. But <laughs> I tried to make her lie. <laughs> uh, well, what is surface stress? And is that something that is kind of important idea, and the idea is that up to now what we have said is that if, you, if we have a surface like that, we have the free energy which is proportional to the surface tension times the area. And the question is, what is the force that, we'll, that we will measure when we pull on that? And up to now wh what we have said is that the force that we me measure when we pull on the surface is simply the surface tension. But if we go to the derivative of this equation with respect to a displacement, what will we have? So we, der we make a derivative of that, and we say, first of all, we will have the terms that we have always, which is gamma times the change of area. But there should be A times the change in gamma. And if we derive this quantity by the area, then we can derive a surface stress, which is the surface tension that we have defined so far, plus a times d gamma over d a. Well, why, didn't, why haven't we talked about that before, when we were discussing about liquids? Hmm? It is zero. Why is that zero for a liquid? It is zero for a liquid because if I change the surface of a liquid, then the molecules which are in the bulk will come at the interface, and then the surface stress will be exactly equal to the surface tension. Well, if there are some surfactants, it could be a already something a little bit different, because if, if, if there are some surfactants at the interface, as we already told, I wrote Marangoni on the blackboard to some point, when I pull on a surface, well, 
if to some point there, there will be less surfactant at the interface, which is more pure water than, than we had at equilibrium, to some point, it will make that the surface stress will not be equal to the, sur to, 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 to the surface tension. So in the community of liquid, this extra term is what people call the Gibbs Marangoni, the Gibbs, the, Gibbs the Gibbs Marangoni elasticity. That's something related to the fact that when I pull on a surface, it will take some time. I mean, if the surfactants are soluble, it will take some time to the surface to come to the interface. So there will be a transi transient state where there is some elasticity at the interface. Or if the surfactants are not soluble, when I pull on the surface, I will dilute the interface. So the interface, the chemical nature of the interface when it's pulled, it's not the same as the, 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 the chemical nature of the interface when it's, it's not pulled. So then we go to this equation. So this is the Shuttleworth equation that has been discussed quite a lot these years. And it tells us that the surface stress should be a function of the deformation of the strain of the interface. So the, 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 the surface tension will depend on the stress and we will have this, this derivative. And the question is, mainly for solids, is this term important? Well, for a crystal, you could think that it's important. Because if I take a crystal, I pull on it, I will displace the atoms of this crystal with in proportion of the strain I apply on the, si on the system. So there should be a variation of the surface energy with respect to the strain. To the strain. Well, I will show you this very nice paper by... Yes? Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I, I mean, I'm not, dis I mean, it's, got, it's not really a question about Newtonian or non Newtonian fluid because it's a surface property. I'm more discussing about a fluid, a fluid which is made of, a pu of the same molecule, a pure, a pure liquid. Then, for a pure liquid, what, whatever the, the, the rheological properties of the fluid, this term should be equal to zero. Because I change the I, I pull on the surface, the molecule will come at the surface, and I will have the same, whatever it's Newtonian or, nu or non-Newtonian. Well, of course, as many of the lecturers already told, usually non-Newtonian fluids are not pure liquids. So if I want to look at fluids that could have this kind of properties, a surface stress, that maybe non-Newtonian fluids will be a good candidate, but for reasons which are not related to their viscosity, but more about the fact that we are dealing with complex fluids. Okay? So I want to discuss this paper by, uh, by Raphael Schulman and, and, and together with Cari Dalnoki Veres and, and Eli Raphael and Thomas Salez. And basically what they, what they wanted to know was, can we use the wetting property in order to test the surface stress? I have a solid, I put a droplet of liquid, I measure the contact angle, I take the same solid, I pull on it, I put the same liquid, I measure the contact angle. If the surface energy depends on the stress, then there is, it will be the signature of the Shuttleworth effect. Okay, so that's the experiment. They, they put a film here in between two, 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 two plates, they pull, on the they pull on the film and they make droplets. So, what do they have is that here it's, it's a polycarbonate, so that's a glassy polymer, and they measure, I don't remember the liquid, but uh, it's probably water glycerol mixture. They put a droplet of liquid. Well, they say that the hysteresis is not too high due to the fact that the, the, their surfaces are smooth enough, and they measure this contact angle, and then they pull on the polycarbonate. When they pull on the polycarbonate, what you see is that they measure a difference in the contact angle. Okay? They do the same with an elastomer. I think it's PDMS elastomer here. Not sure. And now they, uh, 
just look at the number, sorry. Here it's 6% of deformation, whereas here is 100% of deformation, where on an elastomer you can pull a lot. Well, if you, pull, if you deform your sample by 100%, they see no difference. Okay? So then, uh, you, can s you can look at that in more details, uh, but it's basically what they have, and, and I, I won't summarize that, that stuff, but the other thing that they have done is that after having, af after having done the experiment with polycarbonate, they, 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 they have heated the sample and let it cool in order to relax the surface of, th of the their sample, and when, when they do this kind of deformation, then they recover the, 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 the contact angle with no strain. Okay? Yes? Yeah. The argument for a crystal, and it, is, it has been known since years for, for, for a lot of, of systems, is that if I have, I mean, basically what I, if I come back to my really uh, uh, basic definition of surface tension, I say, well, I say I have the atoms like that, and the surface energy is the binding energy divided by the area occupied by the atoms at the interface. Well, if I pull on the solid, then I change this area occupied by the, by, by the atoms, and if I change that, well, I should change the surface energy of the solid. That's the idea, and, it, and basically it works, which means that if they if they take the, 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 the compressibility of their system, they take everything, they are able to recover, to, to say that mainly what they do when they pull on the polycarbonate is, is, polycarbonate is that they dilute the atoms at the interface. And why is that, yeah, why is that different? You, you, you push me to the, to the, the next idea. Why, why is that dif different for elastomers? But what are elastomers at the molecular level? You had already lecture on that. That's a liquid. At the molecular level, if you, if you are at the, the scale of the monomers, mainly you have a liquid. And that's the reason why it's incompressible. You mainly incompressible. You pull on an elastomer, and then the atoms are able to come back at the... I mean, they occupy, they, they occupy all, the, all the volume, so you, you, can, you cannot sustain the strain. Elastomers are incompress incompressible for this reason, and at the, at the surface of an elastomer, what you expect is it should be more or less a liquid plus some cross linking points. And based on that, what people claim in, in this paper is that they perfectly understand the difference between glassy materials and elastomers. For elastomers, they say, well, I pull on it, I do not change that anything at the surface, so I don't change the contact angle, whereas of, whereas of, of, of of glassy polymer, I change the position of the atoms, and then I change the surface energy, I, I change the contact angle. Okay? It could, have, it could have been a nice story which would say, well, we don't care of surface stress for gels, or for elastomers, because that's a liquid at the molecular state, and that's it. Well, and then you have other groups using kind of si different techniques in order to measure the contact angle. The way they are doing the experiments is, uh, is, is this one. What they are doing is that they it's, it's a more expensive technique, so it's more precise technique in order to measure the contact angle. And the way they are doing their experiment is that they pull a silica, a silica bead on the top on a soft silicon gel, and they measure the profile of the interface up to the contact, with different pooling of the beads. So, if they, so there, there will be something which is in between, as already discussed by Matteo, in between the wetting and the adhesion, because it's something which is really soft. You will have this meniscus here. You will be able to pull, so you will be able to increase the area by, by pulling on the beads. And then what they do is they, they fully compute the whole profile of the interface taking into account all the ingredients that you need. So it's really a nice calculation. So they take all the deformation of the elastic material in be below the beads in order that will be responsible of, of the, the total shape, plus 
the surface free energy that could depend on the strain applied during the pooling, the pooling load. The point is that here the deformation are kind of are, are kind of big, as you see. So the deformation needs to use hyperelastic equation in order to completely calculate the, ener the elastic energy stored in, 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 the, in the deformed interface. And here is the result. So that's the surface stress with respect to the deformation. So the deformation go from 0 to uh, 25%. And what you see here is that they measure kind of a strong, deform a strong effect of the deformation on the total surface stress, which is not exactly the same conclusion that what I've said before. It's, it's a gel. It's before it was a, a purely elastomer, and here it's a, it, it's a gel, a swollen gel. Okay? Well, and there is a debate. I, I would not like to enter that much in the debate about why they measure something different or not, but here is kind of de still debate. An important. Yeah? They, uh, sorry, they, 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 what they do is that they, they use confocal microscope, or either they measure, they, they have two techniques, either they measure the profile just by, by, by taking a picture and image, image G, J, or they use confocal microscopy, they want to have some more details on the interface, two techniques, but they, they are always able to measure with a precise determination the, 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 whole, the whole shape of the interface. Okay? Yes? Yeah, it's come to my next slide. <laughs> one of the questions is here, but not only. So one of the questions is related about how do the samples are prepared. And because here, here what we have here is that we, we assume a pure uh, three-phase system an elastomer which has an, an homogeneous properties up to the interface, a surface stress, and some weighting properties. And of course, if there, if there are some chains which migrate at the interface, it can change everything. I mean, just, just like, in, just like in, 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 in surfactant system, if you have some sur surfactant systems, then you can have a, surface, a, a Gibbs Marangoni elasticity, which is, which is not the one. So there is a question of sample preparation. Um, there is also, but this will be, I mean, these there have been some effort now. Uh, there, there was a debate at the beginning of this story where people were really thinking that everything comes from the, the, the sample preparation. So the, there was a huge effort in order to, 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 to have better samples. So I, I, I'm not sure that that's the only reason, despite the fact that it's all, I mean, we know from the surfactant community that a small amount of surfactant can change everything at the interface. But th there is a huge effort on sample preparation. The question of how, what is the length scale at which you define the contact angle is also an important question. Do we, do we go to the, le the length? I mean, it's not exactly the same length. Here you define mainly a macroscopic contact angle, whereas here you are more looking at a, a, a microscopic contact angle. So you go up to really close to the interface. So there is another, another reason. And, and of course, there was also a debate about uh, 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 the, how people analyze the nonlinear the, the non elasticity in this kind of contact. So I don't want to, I mean, I could have spent all my lecture on that, so I don't want to spend all the time, but I just want to, to for you to have this idea in, in, in mind. And I encourage you to, lease, to, to read this paper by, by, by all the participants of the debate, so it, it's, kind of, it's kind of a nice introduction of, of this problem uh, uh, in soft matter uh, a couple of years ago. Any question on that? That's a nice subject. I mean, that's a kind of a hot topic on uh, interfaces in, 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 in soft gels. Yeah, basic, I mean, yeah, that's, so the question is, I mean, I think that 
to be honest, now, the qu at least for myself, and here I'm, I think that I'm kind of going out of what should be a lecture, more, it's more a debate, but it's we are more going to research, so I, I, my, my opinion on that is not definitive, and I could change my mind, so just uh, be cautious of that. Um, my idea here is that what is needed here is a microscopic vision of why there should be such a huge change in surface stress with gels, and this part is still lacking. I mean, people from mechanics, because people from mechanics say that they measure a high surface stress, whereas from a statistical point of view, it's not really obvious to see where it should come from. Okay? Just because, as, 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 as you have seen before, I mean, I am able by even, even really simple arguments to give an idea of what will be the surface-free energy of a solid. And it's not clear for me what kind of ingredients will allow me to double the surface-free energy if at the molecular level the, the, the surface is still a liquid. Okay? That's, a, that's, that's a kind of debate. Okay, so now I will go to the second part, which is the friction of fluids. And I will make a small... Uh, introduction in order to, 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 to discuss about what is the relation between surface energies and adhesion. And the question is, well, let's make an experiment where we have a scotch tape here. You can take the, the 3M scotch, scotch tape as an example, the, 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 w the famous uh, scotch tape by 3M, and you put a surface. What will give the best adhesion? I give you two choices. First of all, I, pr I propose you a fluorinated surface, like a Teflon-like, or a surface where you put, uh, 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 well, which is a surface of really low energy. And the second choice is a, is a silicon surface. And to be completely honest, the, the result I will show you is a glass covered by adsorbed PDMS chains. Okay, so here I will take a glass surface with coated, uh, 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 with grafted uh, uh, silence which are fluorinated, and here I will show you a result with a surface which I have mainly PDMS at the interface. So what's your guess? What will be the, the, higher, in the higher peeling force? What will give the, f the, the, the largest adhesion and why? But first, what will give the, fir the, the higher adhesion? We think that it's fluorinated surface. Four. And we, we think that it's silicon surface. Okay, and why? So now, the, the, so you, you, you mainly voted for silicones. Yeah, basically, I, ta I take this idea and other way of thinking. Because of? Yeah, you know, you, you know that at home, uh, when you buy Teflon, it's, it's, it's supposed to be an anti-adhesive coating. Well, silicon is also an anti-adhesive coating. Both are, both are anti-adhesive coatings. Yes, yeah, Teflon is really w badly wetted. So what, what, what we have in mind, and we have all this idea in mind, is that there is, and it, it has been already discussed in previous lecture, we have all in mind the idea that there is a link between adhesion and wetting. And it's that is, it's, it is the reason why a lot of us are measuring contact angle all the time in order to have idea about contact energies of solids, and we want low contact energy of solids if we don't want adhesion. Okay, that's the idea we have. Well, wh what are the data? So here's that the peeling, the, the peeling force divided by the width, so that the, 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 the adhesion energy, uh, with respect to the peeling velocity for the two coatings, and so, here is the, fluori the, the fluorinated coating, and here is the silicon coating. Well, it's more than one order of magnitude here. So first thing, first idea, it's a good idea. It's really a good idea to keep thinking about measuring contact energies in order to know if a surface will adhere or not. I am not telling you that it's not of, if of importance. It's a good first try, but it not always work. 
Second, why is there such a difference between these two coatings? Well, these data are coming from an experiment again by Manoj Chaudhuri and, 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 and Nubai. And the idea is, so here you have a scotch tape, and what happens when you peel a scotch tape is that there are some tangential force here in the adhesive. And the point is that Nubai was smart enough, and he looked at the position of a particle included in the adhesive here, and some dust at the interface. In the two cases, the case of PDMS surface and the, the, the case of fluorinated surface. And what you see here is that when there was a fluorinated surface, basically, here you have 30 microns, here you have 29 microns, the interface didn't move at all. Whereas here, with PDMS, what happened is that there was some slip of the adhesive close to the surface. There was a movement of the interface relative to the, 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 sc the scotch tape at the interface close to the surface. So, no slip for fluorinated carbon and slip for PDMS. So then, two questions. Why is there a relation, a relation between the slip and the adhesion? And then why is that the difference in slip between PDMS and fluorinated carbon? So first answer. Why is the slip important here? Well, the point is, where does the adhesion come from if I take a scotch tape? To some point, it comes from the dissipation in the adhesive layer, as already told, so that's the reason why it's important to optimize the viscoelastic and nonlinear viscoelastic properties of the adhesive. So, but if there is some slip, mainly you do not shear your, 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 your adhesive layer. So mainly you, you take it as a block and you don't, you don't consume any energy in the adhesive, so the adhesion is low. You need some adhesion at the interface in order to be able to deform the, 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 bulk, the, the, the bulky adhesive part, which gives you large, large adhesion. So at least here we understand why there is a difference when there is some slip and no slip between these two cases. Now the question is, why is there such a difference in slip between PDMS and fluorinated uh, uh, surfaces? I will come back to that later if I'm able to do that, but mainly the idea is that it's no, it's a question of chemistry about the ability to make perfect surfaces in the case of fluorinated surfaces compared to PDMS surfaces. And the point is that fluor with fluorinated carb surfaces, which were, which were done by grafting uh, of silane of the interface, it's always difficult to avoid some holes in the, in, in the interface. And if there are some holes, to some points, the chains of the adhesive can go in the holes and attach, absorb at the interface, and, which, and will kill the slip. Whereas for PDMS, it was long PDMS absorbed at the interface, and these long PDMS chains at SOPs at the interface, they let, they let almost no hole, allowing a large slip of the, P of the PDMS. Okay? So, just to remind you, it's a good idea to try to, to, to change the surface free energy of a solid in order to control adhesion, because it sometimes works, but it not always works, so you have to take care of that. But then, yeah. I will just speak about speed right now. Sleep li right now. Well, what sleep are we talking about? Um, that's a very basic question of fluid mechanics, and, and Anke discussed that yesterday. When you take a liquid, and you share you, you shear liquid between two plates, what you learned from Anke, and you learned, I mean, you knew that before, what you, what you learned is that the velocity of the fluid close to the lower surface is equal to zero. The velocity close to the upper surface is equal to the velocity of the upper plate, and it allows to define the shear rate. But indeed, 
we all learned that, but first of all, those, those of us who are doing rheometry know that sometimes there is some sleep, and then there is no deep physical reason allowing to be sure that there will be no sleep at the interface. And then Navier already, when he wrote the Navier-Stokes equation, he said, well, I have to introduce the viscosity, which is the friction between two layers of fluids. If two layers of fluids have different velo velocities, then it will dissipate energy. But Navier said, well, at the interface, I should write something exactly the same. I should say that there will be a stress at the interface, interface which will be proportional to the difference of viscosity, of velocity, between the solid and the immediate layer of liquid close to the interface. So Navier already thought about that, and indeed in his, paper, in his paper, he was even thinking that the friction of liquids at the interface was the main cause of dissipation when you flow a liquid in a pipe. He didn't think about the bulk viscosity, he was thinking that it was more like solid friction, which is what it is, I mean, here. Well, and usually people, when they work in this kind of question of, question of sleep of liquids, they do not measure the sleep velocity, what they measure is the sleep length, and the sleep length is just the, 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 the length in the solid, whereas if you extrapolate the velocity profile, that is linear, it should go to zero, at the distance from the solid walls, th that is the sleep length. Well, and for simple liquids, there have been a lot of effort in order to measure the sleep length in details, because of course, since it's a very deep question of fluid mechanics, you people really wanted to know what is the sleep length, okay? So what kind of techniques are, are, have they used? So, um, well, the well the, 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 the a very nice technique is the surface force apparatus, it's a technique where basically you approach two surfaces which are smooth enough to very narrow distances and you, you measure the force in order to, expel, to, to expel the liquid from the two surfaces. And from that, if you have all the hydrodynamics, you will be able to measure the sleep length. Okay, that's a nice technique. Indeed, the first experiments have been, have been performed by Shuraev in Russia years ago, and the experiments were more simple. It was basically test some deviation of the Poiseuil law. The idea is to f you force a liquid in a narrow capillary and you measure the pressure drop between the entrance and the head of your capillary. And if you perfectly know the diameter, if there is some sleep plagues, your capillary will appear larger than it is. Well, this technique is really simple in, in ID, but really hard to, 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 to do because as may, maybe you, re you, 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 you remain, the relationship between the pressure drop and the radius is a to the power 4, which means that if you don't precisely know the radius of your, your, your capillary here, you are completely messed. Well, there was also some tentative using more uh, 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 particle tracing close to the interface in order to measure the velocity profile, profile close to the interface, such as TIRF experiment, Total Internal Reflection Fluorescence Microscopy, which works quite well, and some tentative to, 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 to use quartz crystal micro microbalance. And of course, I've shown here surface force apparatus, and people have, 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 have done also measurement using a AFM. And why were people really excited about that? I mean, people were really excited about, about that mainly due to nanofluidics. There is kind of excitation about nanofluidics. The questions are uh, water desalination. So if you want to push water, s salty water in a pore and, 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 and get some fresh water at the out, out, outside of your pore, you want to, I mean, that's inverse osmosis. That's, that's it, it costs you a lot of energy because you have to push a lot due to viscous dissipation in the narrow pores, even though they are, they, they, they are short. But if, if you are able to have, to have some sleep at the interface, then the, the, the flow will be really easy and it will make your life more easy. So due to nanofluidics, there was kind of a high effort in order to, to understand that. Yes? Where does the sleep happen? Well, here you have, uh, as an example, you have uh, 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 an example of the sleep lengths. Uh, that's carbon nanotube here, and that's boron nitride tube, nanotube. And you see that in, in carbon nanotube, people have measured sleep lengths of around uh, uh, 300 nanometers. So sleep, sleep occurs in, na in narrow pores. 
So it's well, it's I mean, sleep is a mic sleep is a due to the interface, so it's an interfacial property which has consequence consequences at large scale because at the end you do hydrodynamics and you measure a change in the pressure drop. So that it comes it comes from something which is microscopic, but the consequences are macroscopic. And well, what do we understand so far for simple liquids? That's water. That's water flowing, I mean, that's water flowing on, on, on solid surfaces. So that's the sleep length. So look at the order of magnitude. That it comes from 0 to 25 nanometers. So when you are a plumber, you don't care about sleep, OK? Your, 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 your pipe diameter of, uh, of 10 centimeters, you don't care if the, there is a sleep length of, of, of 25 nanometers. But if you do, if you do nanofluidics, that's yes, you, you have to care of, of that. So the sleep lengths are of the order of a couple of nanometers. And as I would have expected, there is an influence of the wetting properties of water. So the more the water adheres, so the lower the contact angle is, the lower the sleep length is. And if I go to surfaces which are hi more hydrophobic, I see an increase of the contact angle. So that's, well, the water doesn't like the surface. So to some points, I understand why the, su the surface sleeps more. So that's experimental data from several groups using several techniques. And here are numerical simulations. That's a paper which is, uh, now it's 10 years old, but this, I mean, things are not changed that much about numerical simulation. So that's, that's, that's the, 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 the numerical simulation for kind of very fancy uh, 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 molecular molecular uh, 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 potential. So they really try hard to, to, to mimic water. And what they have is that, well, basically the same order of magnitude for the CD planes, which go from 0.25 nanometer. But look, if they want to reach 20 nanometers of sleep in numerical simulations, they have to have water with a contact angle of 150. That you cannot do. There is no surface treatment available that allows you to make a contact angle of 150. You can go to this kind of angle using, using uh, 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 Owens Wentz, uh, sorry, using, using uh, rough surfaces and, and, ca and Cassie even cell transition and so on. But I mean, then if you, have, if you add roughness to the models, you change everything. So what this tells is that, well, there is, kind, there is still a discrepancy between numerical simulation and, 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 and experiments regarding, regarding the sleep, about the molecular origin of sleep. So now there are some new papers arriving some months ago saying that in order to really understand, you have to take into account the, some quantum effects, which, which are the quantum modes of the surface, which is below, and the quantum modes of the liqui li li liquid, which is, which is above. And as Professor Grossberg said, we try to avoid quantum effects today, so I will skip this part. I mean, you are, you're perfectly right. I mean, I do not mention surface, surface roughness because as far as, as we know, I mean, uh, as su and th that's, that's still an open que question. People try really hard to make the surface as smooth as possible. So they take uh, mica surface, they take silicon wafers, they, they put x-rays on it, and they say, they, they claim, that they have a roughness, an average rough roughness, which is less than one nanometer, often less than that. Okay, and that what is true is that as soon as the surface, the surfaces are not good enough, uh, uh, you kill, you completely kill, kill this effect, ev even this small effect. So the and and that that raises the, the questions that you have. I think it is a question that to what level of Smoothness do we need to go in order to, to, to completely have uh, s uh, uh, s yeah that's part that's part of of the question yeah to 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 to, to predict the, sl the sleep I think that you should discuss with Suzanne about that. She's an expert on that. 
despite the fact that she she is not simulating water, so she has she is using Lena Jones potential, but she she can really give you the details. That I mean, basically, just to 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 make a quick answer, but you will have all the details with 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 Suzanne, who is much more smart than I am. But the 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 the, the, the basic idea is that you are two way to measure the, the the slip the slip length in numerical simulation. So you have to put your what your liquid and put the right interaction potential between the molecules and the molecules and the surface. So if you want to, to have real water, it's, it shouldn't be Lena Jones. You have to take more smarter potential. And then you, you, you do exactly what, is what uh, people do in the experiment. You shear and you measure the velocity profile. Well, we tr I mean, we trust what has a put I mean, I mean, all the potential we ha that are available for, 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 for water, they are able to reproduce the, the, the viscosity, they are able to reproduce the triple point, they are able to reproduce the surface tension. So, I mean, to some point, there's, I mean... There's yeah, but, I mean, it seems it doesn't work, and then we have to understand why, but, I mean, I mean there are a lot of reasons why to trust this numerical simulation. I'm not an expert of that, but, I mean, at least it's really important to know that if you take state-of-the-art numerical simulation, it doesn't work because it, it tells you that there is something in below. Maybe you, you are right, Susan. Maybe I won't go to the solid surface friction. <laughs> 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 and, but, but the question is, <laughs> the, 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 the question is, you all know that polymer, fri polymer fluids, they can, they can sleep a lot. I mean, you know that in rheometer. If the slip length of a polymer melt of a polymer melt or a polymer solution will be o of 25 nanometer, you you wouldn't care at all in a rheometer. The reason why you care about slip in a rheometer is because the slip length can be millimetric or micro at least micrometric. And then I want to to explain you why it, why there could be a large slip for for for, for, for polymer fluids compared to simple liquids. And 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 to come back I, again, I come back to Navier. And, and I tell you, I will take my time and, and, and we'll see what we are able to do. And the basic idea is that, well, I, I, I will write the Navier hypothesis, which is here. I say that the, the stress exerted by the liquid at the interface, at the zero depth, is a coefficient that I call k times the slip velocity. So basically what I assume is a linear response of the interface. I assume that the, sh the, 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 the stress is proportional to the, to, to, to the velocity. And the the exactly, the tangential stress at the interface. And in the bulk, I know what is the stress exerted by a liquid on in the interface. For a Newtonian liquid, it is simply the viscosity times the derivative of the vis velocity with respect to the height. Yeah, because here that's a bulk property. That's the constitutive equation for a for a Newtonian fluid. And here that's a constitutive equation of the interface, where I simply assume that the, the stress is proportional to the velocity. Exactly. Linear hypothesis. I mean we are physicists, we take the the simplest explanation as possible and, and linear I mean linearity is always is already difficult. Let's let's keep it linear. But, I mean, for you're right, for, 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 for in the bulk, the, line, uh, the, 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 the linear relation between the stress and the shear rate has been widely verified, whereas at the interface, that's kind of a, a stronger hypothesis just because the number of verification is lower. But that's the same, that's the same level of hypothesis. And then you, you write a balance between these two stresses at the interface, and what I, I, I skip the mass, but you can relate this gradient of velocity to both the slip velocity here and the slip length. So if you do that, at the end, you will say that the slip length B is the ratio between the bulk viscosity divided by the Navier interfacial friction. And here it already tells us something which is important is that we all measure slip lengths. But in slip lengths, you have two quantities which are a little bit independent a bulky property, 
and here a surface property. So it mixed two properties. So, and then based on that, based on the idea that B is the ratio between the viscosity and K, the gen gave a very nice explanation of why the slip length of polymer melts should be high. And the idea is the following. I take some time to explain it because I, I find it really elegant. That's, it. That's, a, a that's a paper which, which is written in French in the Compte Rendu de l'Académie Science. That's a really small paper, but with a really, really nice idea. And basically, the idea is that I take a fluid of monomers, and I will write the, the, the relation that I've written bef before, which is the slip length before polymerization is the viscosity of this fluid, which is low, divided by the Navier coefficient. And now I polymerize the fluid. And the idea of the gen is the following, is that if I polymerize the fluid, I will increase a lot the viscosity of the fluid. But the gen idea was, I will not change anything at the friction property. The friction is something which is really local, so I should, keep the I should keep the same K value. So now the, the slip length of this polymer fluid will be the viscosity of this polymer divided by the same Navier coefficient. And then if you put everything together, you arrive to this equation, which is the slip length of a polymer of legs. Uh, yes? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you think in terms of the gen idea was really that the that the the k was really something which was really local, which was really depending on the monomer surface interaction. So of course, the fact that this 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 monomer is linked to this one maybe change a little bit the potential, but not that much. Basically, the interaction between this one and this one does, didn't change that much. I mean, that's an hypothesis. Huh? So if you do that, it tells you that the slip length of the, the, of the polymer fluid will be the slip length of a simple fluid. That is small. We already see, have seen that for water, it should be something like one nanometer or less, but which is small, times the ratio between the viscosity of the polymer divided by the viscosity of the fluid here. Which is larger. You know that the viscosity of a polymer is larger than the viscosity of the fluid of monomer. How larger? That polymer melts. How larger? It depends on what? It depends on the degree of polymerization. Okay? The longer the chain, the, l the more viscosity is. So now how for a polymer melt? That's the end of the second week. <laughs> how, do how, does the how does the viscosity of a polymer melt depends on the length of the chain? And to the half? <laughs> That's okay. Like to the power three. Who else? I think it's really disappointing for some of my of, for for some for some of the other lecturers. So try to make something because I see Mike in the in the back. <laughs> so. <laughs> How <laughs> does the viscosity of a polymer melt depends on the molecular weight of the ch of the polymer? Well, we are in the morning. Depends. Just always. That's a good good answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it depends of what low molecular chain. We are more in a Rouse regime where the viscosity will increase like n to the power one, let's say. And if we go to entangled polymers we'll go to a dependency of n to the power 3 if we just follow rotation theory 
or 3.4 if we look at experiments. Okay? Remember now? I'm sure. So, so it can be large, yeah. How do what I measure is simply well several several just go to Suzanne again. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you measure the sleep length, so again it, it will it, what you you know the viscosity because I mean you, 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 you are doing nicely the rheometry, avoiding the sleep. S and then, so you know, et, you know eta, the viscosity, and then you measure the sleep length with all the techniques I've, uh, I've shown before, and then you, you say B is, uh, K is, is eta over B. Yes? No. So, 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 the objective of this exercise is to understand why B for a polymer can be large. I mean, the idea is that B will be large just because polymers are viscous. Even though the friction, is, the, 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 the friction is high, the fact that the viscosity is high will allow the polymer to have long sleep lengths. Same friction, but long sleep lengths. So that it explains why it's a problem. It's a problem with polymers in a rheometer. Yes. How is shear thinning effect? Ah, that's a that. Let's then for sure we won't do any s solid friction. But I, I will show you. But I, I can already tell you. I mean, the, the easiest the, the easiest blah blah blah, the easiest way of of taking into account shear thinning will say that shear thinning will affect this vis viscosity here. Or this, or this K coefficient here, but in, in a simple approach, what we can already think is that eta is a long-range phenomenon because it's due to complex fluids, so it, it's due to something which, hap which happened at the scale of the chain, let's say, whereas K is something which happened at the scale of a monomer. So probably what we will have is that it's and it's, I mean, there is not an extensive study of that, but what we can expect is that B uh, 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 will depend on the shear rate just due to the effect of the shear rate on, on eta. Okay? K being loca local, we don't, care, we don't care that much if we have uh, 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 stretches the polymer chains, I mean, which will strongly affect the eta, but not the K, because K is local. Well, so how do m people measure, measure this kind of stuff? Um, so I, I just wanted to show you this very nice uh, example done by Mark Hilton uh, together with same kind of people that before, Elie Raphael, Caridel Lokiveres, and so on. And the way w they were measuring steep lengths was really smart. It was in polystyrene. And the way they were, th they were measuring stuff is that they were doing nanometric layers of polymers uh, and they were doing two thicknesses like that, okay? They do two thicknesses of polymer with a nanometric thickness here. So they do, they do that uh, below the glass transition temperature and they heat their sample. And when they heat this, their sample, due to surface tension, I mean, surface tension makes that you don't like corners like that. So corners will flatten. There will be a flow in between the, 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 the two surfaces. And if you are able to monitor the hate profile among time, knowing the hydrodynamics, you will be able to measure the sleep lengths because the hydrodynamics will be affected by the sleep lengths. Okay? And they have done that. So that's the sleep length they measure. So look at the order of magnitude. So it's here it's 10 microns. Here it's 0.1 mi microns. Here are the molecular weight of uh, polystyrene. And what they have is that let's concentrate on the de-wetting experiments that I, I mean, sorry, that sorry for that. Um, here, that's the, that's, that's the experiment with leveling experiment, which is here. What they have is that at low, at low velocity, 
at slow molecular weights, they recover something which is a sleep length which, which increases like the molecular weight to the power one, like in the Rouse regime. Well, they were not able to measure long sleep, le long sleep lengths with this kind of experiment, so what they have done is that they, they have done another experiment, and the way I'm explaining, I agree, is a little bit messy, so I apologize ab about that. Um, they, are, they were also doing some de-wetting experiments, which are more simple. So you put a, you put a droplet and you, so you look at how it de-wets. The, de the wetting velocity will depend on the sleep. And well, these experiments are nicer. And here, with these experiments, they were able to, to have uh, n, to, n to the power 3.4 in this regime and uh, n to the power 1 in this regime. So the transition between the, the Rouse regime and, 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 and the entangled regime here. With the de-weighting experiment, I don't sh I'm not sure that we I will be able to discuss that later. The reason why they, 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 had low they were not able to have sufficiently high steep lengths was the fact that they had some adsorbed chains, and due to the adsorbed chains, adsorbed chains like roughness kill the sleep. Okay? So that's a way of measuring the sleep lengths and K. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I should have, ex I mean, if you ask this question, it's, it, just, it just means that I'm not clear enough. Um, what I'm saying basically what I'm saying basically is that with simple, with simple fluids, the sleep length is low, and I, wi I am not able to measure it. So I am saying that B is equal to B0, which is between, let's say, if it's below one nanometer, I cannot even measure it. It's below the size of an, of an atom. So if I would say that below one, nan one nanometer, I, I won't measure anything to, let's say, the maximum that people measure is something like 20 nanometers for, for, for water on hydrophobic surfaces. But uh, what I say is that for polymers, this is amplified by the ratio between the viscosity of the polymer divided by the viscosity of the simple fluid. So the only reason for, for which we, can, we have a huge sleep with polymer is that they are more viscous. They are more viscous, but the friction at, at the molecular level is the same. And It makes me a transition to... She's here. <laughs> she tried to, to hide herself, but <laughs> she's here. So curly hairs. If you, if you, if you curly hair, if you, if you hesitate, just look at curly hair. <laughs> and, la la and now I'm, I, I, I'm feeling like uh, a dad who makes uh, uh, her daughter ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> but he's proud. <laughs> um, the question that we want to, 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 to answer with, with, with Suzanne is now the question about, well, here we have a system where the, the, the sleep length increases increase because entanglements increase the viscosity, but what happens with the, with the fluid where we increase the, 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 the viscosity when we go closer and closer to the glass transition temperature? And that's the question of how do, does the glass transition temperature affect the sleep length? Okay. So, so now I have a choice. I can let you the choice. I can keep going on this story of sleep, or I can switch to solid, solid state, fri solid state fri friction. I stay with fluids? Solids? Okay. I make a tentative of, so of uh, friction of solids. So friction of, so of solids, that's, a, that's an older story. And, I, we, have and, and, and we, we, we have 20 minutes in order to, to, dis to discuss uh, this story, which basically, I mean, started from ancient times. As soon as people were working, they had to, de to deal with friction. Without friction, you cannot move, so friction is important in every day. But the first we really make a tentative to, to, to write something of, on, on friction is uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And here's at the Codex of Leonardo da Vinci, where he basically measures 
what now we call the solid friction coefficient. So that's a codex. So what you, what we, what you call a lab, uh, a lab book, he calls that a codex, and it costs a lot. So think about it when you are writing your lab book. It could cost a lot in the future. Well, and basically what he has done so far is that, I, I mean, Exactly what you will do when you, you do a solid friction experiment, you put a solid like that, and you pull on it, and you want to know uh, how much you have to pull in order to displace these objects. And I will come back about the definition of solid friction, and, and, and but Leonardo da Vinci said that the friction coefficient wa was 0.25 for any solids. Well, not that bad. I mean, that's an order of magnitude. Let's, 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 let's say like a physicist, that's a good order of magnitude. <laughs> Well, and we had to, so that's the most modern version, so that's Coulomb, 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 Coulomb article, and uh, 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 the, 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 the really well-known names associated to solid friction are, Am are Amonton and Coulomb, and basically they, 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 they wrote all the, 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 the laws that we are dealing with in, in solid friction. And what, what are these laws? And, well, there are some that you have in mind pretty well. So that's the experiment. You have this, we, you, we have this solid, we, we, we have this object, and we want to measure the force required to make this object, this object move. So first law, if I start from rest, and I measure the force in order to make this object move, the force at the threshold is proportional to the normal load. Okay, and this proportionality, this coefficient of proportion proportionality, defines the static friction coefficient. As you know, because you have all tried to move a washing machine, the first step is hard, but as soon as it moves, it goes fast. Not that, Not that. I'm strong, <laughs> <laughs> or a certain inertia, I don't know, <laughs> or heavy. <laughs> but, but you know that. Here I'm telling you two things. First of all, that during the movement, the force is not the same, but the force during the movement is still proportional to the normal load, which allows me to define a dynamic friction coefficient, which is a tangential force during the movement divided by the normal load. Then I'm telling you that since the force is lower during the movement, the dynamic friction coefficient is lower than the static friction coefficient. So all that you know, and there are two extra laws that we always forget. First of all, the dynamic friction coefficient does not depend that much on the velocity, which is not that obvious. And the second law that we always forget, which is the more difficult to understand, is both the static and dynamic friction coefficient does not depend on the contact area. And this is completely non-trivial completely not trivial, because it means that it means that if I take this coach tape, I put it here, I measure the force required to make it move, I will need the same force if I put the scotch tape box in this direction and I make it move. The friction coefficient does not depend on the contact area. It's, it is what, is what it means. And this is really, really counterintuitive. Yeah, I mean, what, what I defined, I mean, the idea is that I have the load, I measure the force, the friction coefficient is the force divided by the load, which is a normal weight. So here my box, it has the same weight. So when I measure the, when, when I measure the, the tangential force, I directly measure the, the, the friction coefficient with a unity which is a normal load. And what I claim is that the force does not depend on, on the area. If I do something like that? Well, here it's a little, I mean, here it's kind of pathologic situation. 
well, it's really non, non it's really counterintuitive because as an example, I, I mean, my son, as an example, when I want to, to, to pull him some, 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 somewhere, the first thing he does is he just sits on the floor and hopes that like that it will be more difficult to, to pull him. So that's really counter, that's really something that, that goes again your, 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 your deep intuition about friction. And does that work? Well, and, and again, I mean, yeah, th again, th the idea that the friction coefficient does not depend, here, here what you see is, is something which is related to the idea of the independence with the contact area, here is that the friction coefficient with respect to the normal load on something like uh, one, two, three orders of magnitude, and you see that uh, that's for steel and aluminum in air, and you see that the friction coefficient is independent on the normal load which really thinks that it does not help that much in terms of friction coefficient to push more on, on your surfaces. And that's, again, it's, it's, it's not intuitive at all. So, let's go to that. And, and basically, if we want to understand what is be, be behind this idea of friction coefficient, which is independent on the, on, 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 on the, on the on normal load or on the contact area, we have to have in mind the fact that real surfaces are rough. Real surfaces are not planar. There is always a roughness which, make, which makes that the place where the, the surface is really touched is always much smaller than the apparent contact area. And what I tell so far is that the friction coefficient was independent on the contact area. And here you have this nice experiment by, by Dietrich and Gil Gilmore. They used they use, they use PMMA. They, they use rough PMMA surfaces, they shine light in, the, in between, and in, in the region where, where there is a real contact, the, la the light goes through, whereas in the surface where th there is some air, there is a total internal reflection, so the, the, the light doesn't go through. So it allows them to measure the real contact area between two roof surfaces made of PMMA, and what they, what they have shown is that the real contact area, which is not the apparent contact area, increases with this kind of surfaces proportionally to the normal load. So the apparent contact area is the same, but the real contact area increases normally, uh, proportionally to the normal load. So I will try in the 10 last minutes to, to, to give you two different mechanisms which will allow you to understand why this real contact area is independent of the normal, uh, is proportional to the normal load. And the first one is due to, to Tabor. And the idea is that when you, since the surfaces are rough, the pressure between two asperities in contact is high. And basically, the idea of Tabor is that, so that's the 50s, so it's, it's af I mean, the first microscopic interpretation on the solid friction coefficient is after quantum mechanics, so that's modern physics. Uh, 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 so the, the, the idea is that when two asperities are in contact, they sustain a large load, and if the load is large, they can go up to the, their yield stress. That's the idea. That's basically the idea. And so basically the idea is that the normal load divided by the real contact area saturates within the asperities to the hardness of the material, which is something related to, to, to the, the, the yield stress. Okay, that's, that's the idea. And then, the idea is that now I have these asperities which have been plastified, and I have to shear them, and ta Tabor ID was, well, as soon as I've made this junction, just because I've plastified my two asperities, if I shear this junction, Again, in order to get a movement, I will have to apply a shear on this junction, which is more or less the shear stress. So the idea was the shear force will be a critical stress proportional to, 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 proportional to the real contact area. And if you combine these two equations, at the end, you, have, you will have simply that the, sh the shear force is proportional to this shear the, 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 the shear threshold for, for, for yielding in the, in the parallel direction divided by the hardness times the normal load. So in this picture, then the static friction coefficient is simply 
the yield stress in this direction for flow divided by the yield stress in the normal direction for flow. And then it gives you the idea that, well, both have, have the same molecular origin. It's both plastic flows. So since it's both plastic flows, this should be of the order of one. And indeed, if you do some more fancy mechanics of contact, you can use the Tresca criterion for the flow in this direction and the, and the one in this direction. And if you do something a little bit better, it will even tell you that the, f the, the, sorry, that the mu friction coefficient will be equal to 0 0.166, which is not that far from what Da Vinci said years ago. Because that's the idea of, of that's the first idea. So one model of, of static friction is the fact that asperities plastify and flow. The point is that if you do the experiment with elastomer, rough elastomer, well, again you find elastomer is a little bit more complicated. Usually with elastomer, the friction coefficient is not always independent of the contact area because you know that the tires on your car have not the same size as the tires on your bike, which is probably due to the fact that the friction coefficient somehow depends on the contact area on the for, 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 for elastomers. But anyway, you can still define, uh, you, s you can still define the friction coefficient, which, m which, which means that there is a proportionality between the tangential stress and the normal load in elastomers. And then for this system, you do not expect that much plasticity. So you have to find another model in order to understand this kind of, 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 of flows. And the, 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 the most basic idea will be this one. Well, we have rough surfaces, so friction is due to an assembly of n contacts with a typical size of radius r that you pull. And then if you do that, if the contact area is proportional to the normal load, then you will say that, well, the stress during the friction is proportional to the contact area. This idea is kind of easy to understand. It will help. So if you do that, or n asperities, you apply a normal load W, which means that the load of on one asperity is W divided by n, the number of asperity. So how does the contact area sc scales with the normal load? So the answer is here. So Ken gives, gave the answer. So I took Ken's lecture. So here you see that. So of course, since we didn't work enough together, so, 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 so what what I call W is called pH here. But that's the same. And the radius of contact of each asperity is A. So that's OK. We, we have the same notation here. So here you see that there is not a linear relationship between the load on one asperity in an Hertzian contact and the contact area, which tells us the real contact area would scale like W to the power two thirds. One half was okay. So which tells me that if I want to make a model as a physicist, which is as simple, as simple as possible, this is too simple. This doesn't work. So, but people are smart. And there have been two kinds of models, and I think it's a good, it's a good point to first stop here. So the first model has been done by Greenwood and Williamson, and basically they, they kept the idea that there will be some asperities of radius R, but the only difference between my very naive model and the one of Greenwood and Williamson is that they distributed the, 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 the height of the spheres at different height with a Gaussian, with a Gaussian distribution of height. And then if you do that, you recover, I mean, I, I, I have no time to make the math, but if you do that, you recover the fact that you will increase regularly the number of contacts by pushing your surfaces together, and which will make the contact area proportional to the normal load with this, with this model. And then there have been some other models developed by Pearson and, 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 and other, but ma mainly by Pearson. And the idea was not to take 
run bumps with a, with a Gaussian distribution of eight, but instead of that, a person proposed to, to use a fractal description of the interfaces, wh whereas the idea was, if I look at a surface at a certain, I mean, that's again the, 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 the idea of fractal widely, exp largely explained by, 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 by Mike about the fact that you have this roughness at a, at a certain scale. If I zoom in, I will say almost the same roughness and so on. So, person develops this ID, and again, with this ID, you, reco you recover the, the, this ID that the, no the, the, the contact area will be proportional to the normal load. Okay? And that's an interesting ID, and what is interesting now is that due to a very nice combination of surface technique characterization, which allows to you X-rays, atomic force microscopy, uh, optical uh, profilometer, and so on, it's really possible to, to make surfaces where you are able to measure the, 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 the height profiles at very different length scales, which allow to, to, to test these ideas of fractal uh, 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 description of the interface and to test precisely the ideas which are below this, this, this statistical model. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. That's the point. Okay? So then, I will tell you this story, but not explain in detail, but I will just give you some, some, some more fun ideas about solid friction. Up to now, what I have said so far is that I can define both a static friction coefficient, which does not depend on the velocity, uh, sorry, a dynamic friction coefficient, which does not depend on the velocity, and a static friction coefficient. So I just want to give you two ideas mo more. First, so that's the static friction coefficient with respect to the contact time of the surface. So the people have done this experiment. You take two surfaces, you put them into contact, you wait, and you measure the static friction coefficient for several contacts. This is Bristol, Bristol, uh, steel, steel, PMMA, PMMS, limestone. And what people measure is here, the friction coefficient increases with respect to time. The friction coefficient increases with respect to time. Yeah, I put the surface in contact. Exactly what they do is that they slide it a little bit in order to, to kind of prepare the surface. Then they stop. They say that's, that time is equal to zero. And then they wait. It's one second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds, 1,000 seconds. And they measure the, the, the friction coefficient. And friction coefficient ages. You can you can do both. You can you can make new contacts or you can you can slide and stop. So do you have any idea of wha wha what it is due? And then I have to stop. Thermal creep. Yes, you can you you can elaborate a model where as soon as you have said that the surfaces are flowing due to due to yield stress. Then it takes some time to do that, and if you if you if if you if you make a model based on thermal creep, you, you will be able to recover all these all these. So based on that, I skip some slides, and I will make a conclusion of this messy lecture. So um, just I, I just want to remind remind you what we discussed so far. So we discussed at the introduction the question of surface stress and s and discussed the fact that it's still kind of a debate, interesting debate about these, and there should be some effort put on this question uh, in the in the future. Then we discussed the friction of fluids and we discussed why there should th there exist a large a large slip for polymer melts, and of course it opens the question of all the, the kind of things that you are studying, guys, some of you are studying the friction of gels, microgels, uh, polymer solutions, and so on. And then the mechanism of sleep can be really different than the one that I discussed so far. And I, I just gave you a flavor of what is solid friction and the fact that, again, a, 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 an important parameter is, in, is the roughness, as discussed before. And if we want to 
precisely understand what is the friction coefficient, you, we, we really have to, to, to have well-prepared surfaces with well-defined chemistry and a well-defined roughness profi profile at all scales, which makes all these experiments diffi difficult. And, and, and basically, really to conclude, and that will be my last sentence, uh, what I think is interesting is now there is kind of real interest in, in bulk rheology that people have developed, and, and as you see, the, the, there is a lot of techniques, a lot of efforts in order to understand bulk rheology, and I think that right now, by combining all the understanding about solid friction and liquid friction at interface, what we are able now to do is to do more uh, 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 a rheology of the solid-liquid interface or solid, solid interface with a kind of same uh, 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 ideas that developed before. With that, I, th I thank you for your attention. Yeah. I wouldn't say that. I, I, I wouldn't say that. I'm sure that the dissipation in the bulk will be always higher than the dissipation at the interface. That's, that's I mean, since indeed what th th there is not that much which is known of the dissipation at the interface, I wouldn't be able to say that it will be always like that. In exactly. A question here, maybe? Yeah. Uh, apart from friction, yeah. many surfaces get charged when, when you uh, when there is friction. Yeah. What is known about it? That's, that's really messy. <laughs> I mean, triboelectricity, I mean, basically, I mean, to be, to be completely honest, first of all, the experiments are really difficult to do because you are sensitive to, you. I mean, you are sensitive to humidity, always like with charges and so on. Uh, and, and, and for me, except the idea that you will have this triboelectricity if the level Fermi of the two materials that you put together is not the same close to the surface, uh, I don't know that much. But as, as, I, to, as far as I understand, there is no clear... Uh, uh, molecular pictures that al will allow me, as an example, I will be able to make a lecture on that. I, will I could probably, I mean, it's not my subject, but I think that we are more on a research topic than something which is well et established to give a clear lecture. Which is why we teach this to every student in the introductory physics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that you have these. The, 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 the idea is that you have the, you have these asperities in, in 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 contact. You plastify them when you make the contact, and then you have to 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 destroy them. And when you destroy them, then it, you 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 pass the peak of, of static friction. But as soon as you move your surface, you make new contacts, and then you have to 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 kill every time new contacts, which makes that there is still a dynamic friction coefficient. Yeah, I would say I, 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 I would say that, but but also there is also a effect of the velocity on the on 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 the on, on the def creep of your materials that you have to take into account if you want to make a, a whole description of of this effect of velocity. Yeah, you have to take some velocity effect in the yield stress, and also you know one of the cons one of the consequences of the fact that the static friction coefficient ages among, among time is that, on the contrary, the dynamic friction coefficient decreases logarithmically with the velocity. And the reason for that is the fact that when, when, I, when I slide my two surfaces, I, I make always new contacts, and the time I spend, I mean, I, the time I spend on an asperity depend on the velocity. So there is a relationship, and th that's all the stuff by Rice and Ruina uh, in the 
1960s mainly, uh, to relate the aging of the friction coefficient with the, 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 the fact that the fr dynamic friction coefficient decreases with velocity. And the point is that measuring a friction coefficient, and after that I stop, uh, and the fact that it's difficult to measure a dynamic friction coefficient which decreases with velocity, it is that it's an instable system. Because I push, the friction coefficient decreases, so I will it will be easier for me to, pitch to push faster, and then it is what is at the origin of the stick slips that we measure in solid friction. So then we, it's, it's really hard to apply constant velocity profile when we do this kind of experiment. And for that, we can go to the coffee break, and I will answer to the question with the coffee. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you.